Imagine the answer is yes. Some trouble for me and even for you, even more for you. So, but the answer is not yes. It's not yes. But it's worth spending like 20 minutes on the topic. So we all agree technology changes the way we talk, the way we write, the way we communicate, the way we memorize, the way we etc. etc. So now the ultimate question, is there any impact on the way we think? And the answer is yes, definitely, definitely. The answer is yes, and we have to talk about. So I'll develop an argument in four steps. I have 20 minutes, so maybe four minutes to recap. In the end, what is to think? Then, for, for five minutes, what is to think in a technological environment? Then we're going to focus for four minutes on big data, as an example. And finally, we'll, not conclusion, but some comments about the, the topic. So let's start with the deep think. How do we think? And I, I'm an engineer, but I had the chance to graduate in philosophy, so I, I think I have some clues, some elements to offer today. There was a, a philosopher who was interviewed by a journalist, and the journalist asked him, what do you think about Canadians? And he answered, I'm sorry, I don't know all of them. And, okay, you can laugh, but this is something. Because imagine I ask you what you think about Canadians, I'm sure you come with an answer, but you don't know all of them. So it means that we build thinking, a bit of knowledge, but a lot of ignorance. So how does it happen when a father or a mother tells somebody, I'm thinking about my children? This is true. When the CEO of a large company tells a journalist, I'm thinking about my clients, this is not true. It is impossible. How do you want to think about two million people? It is impossible. So, but I don't tell you he doesn't do anything. So what does he do exactly? He used something, something. And I remember I worked recently for a large department store. And the CEO once said, we, got, we should do something for the young mother. I say, fine. And then, why not for young fathers? He was a bit puzzled, say, hmm, no. It was the answer, not from the brain, but from somewhere here. And young mother is a concept. And it shows us how we think. Between the world and a million clients and the complexity, diversity, and ourselves, we use concepts. We use concepts. So this is the playground. To think is a bit like to play. That's where it happens, between you and the world. So the first step, we simplify the world. Young mother, it's a concept. And then we use the concept. So it shows that Thinking is made of two pieces. In the mind, we only have models, stereotypes, theory, ideas, hypotheses, framework, mindset, paradigms, etc. Let's summarize. We have simplifications. To think is mostly about simplifying the world and using the simplifications. That's what we do. On one hand, we conceptualize, we simplify. On the other, on the other hand, we use the concepts. Two things to remember about concepts. First, in order to conceptualize, you have to forget. If you want to build the young mother concept, you have to forget most of your clients. You need to forget. Second thing, and it's a consequence, a concept is never true, never false. The only relevant question about the concept, is it useful? Is it useful? And young mother, it's useful, you can do things, you can change. So, let's have the definition. Again, to think is mostly about simplifying the world and using the simplifications. Philosophers have two names for the two different ways. 
At the bottom, it's called deduction. Use a concept and go to the world. Young mother, I go to the world. But what interests me, the upper arrow, how do we simplify? How do we produce concepts? And this is called induction. And induction is probably the, the most difficult challenge for a human being. Why? A perfect deduction is possible with algorithm. A perfect induction is impossible. It means you never have truth on the left side. You only have hypothesis. A concept is a possibility. And you see the arrow. You have many, many different possibilities. When you segment your market, you produce young mother and not young father. But there is no way to prove you are the best. This is the best way. So doubt is required. And of course, this remains true in a technological world. Of course. And sometimes strange things do happen. It's in French, just to show you from time to time, Amazon suggests me to read my own books. So, <laughs> and so, are you interested by this, this? You should read that. Or say, yes, I don't need to read, I wrote. I tell, I, uh, so, it means that sometimes in the technological world, you have like, something's missing. And sometimes, I believe we're a bit like that. We use the tool, the new technology, but we don't create new mindsets. And that's, of course, the main message for today. New technology requires new mindset. If you don't do that, you're at risk. Look at this one. It's a plane, a plane, it never flew. What's the problem? He tried to imitate the bird. Tried to imitate the bird. People succeeded in flying when they forget about the birds. For engineers, you know, it's nothing to do with like this. And so, another example. This is the car of my grandmother. And look at the arrow. What is this arrow? It's technology, but quote, stupid. What happened? Before there was nothing, so the driver has to do this with his arm to show we want to make a left. So an engineer said, oh, we need to technology to solve the problem. No, it's not a solution. It's just an imitation of the current mindset. And look at this one. It's a very old train. You see the coach on the right side. Look carefully how it is built. And now look at this one. You see the U-shaped stagecoach with two banks, two doors? That's what they use as a mental model to build the coach. Of course, it's a bit stupid because you have as many doors <laughs> as you have coaches. You see the problem? The problem, you need new mindsets. And of course, it's still valid with the electricity. If you take a, the first electric sewing machine, it's just electricity added on the non-electric machine. The first electric calculating machine, exactly the same, exactly the same. So we have to avoid that. And of course, this is a bit the danger. The danger is to forget new technology requires new mindset, new mindset. You have many, many examples. The first website 20 years ago, what was it? Just a copy paste of the annual report. The annual report. It was on paper, it was put on screen. And of course, it doesn't work. It does, the, the outcome is disappointing and boring and boring. The light bulb is not an improved candle, the mouse is not an improved keyboard, etc., etc. Et you have two different changes on technology. You know Gillette with the razor? When they have a drop in sale, they add a blade. But, okay, it works one, two, three times, but one time, yeah, you reach, you reach like the end. And of course, you need a new mindset. And that's why this is so important to remember. The brick of thinking is concept. You cannot be good for your market if you don't produce concept like a young mother. But a machine cannot conceptualize. 
cannot conceptualize because you need to forget. You need to forget. And of course, the outcome of a machine is certainty. What we have here? Only hypothesis, hypothesis. And you have like a two movement in the, in the brain. Let's imagine you're thinking about your next vacation. So you can start, okay, I'm going to go to Belgium, no, too much rain, Spain, I've been there before, so that's... If you're in this mood, it's very hard to buy the ticket. Because you're inducing, and suddenly you read the simplification. I'm going to... Yes, Normandy, second half of August, and then you can move on the internet and select the right ticket, etc. You are in deduction. A computer cannot forget, cannot forget, so... A computer cannot conceptualize. And concepts are the key condition of, of thinking. And that's what we see. Of course, technology doesn't make us stupid, but technology changes the rule of the game, including the game of thinking. Let's talk a minute about big data. Big data. This was the big data of Johannes Kepler. 500 years ago, a bit less. He has like a great insight, fantastic insight. Wow, he said, planets are moving around the sun, not with circle, with ellipse, S ellipse. Great insight. His big data was this, the sky. It was hundreds and thousands of observations. But something is important. The ellipse existed before. The concept of ellipse existed since the antique Greece with Apollonius, etc. So what happened in Kepler's mind? He matched suddenly a current, an existing concept with something out of big data, out of big data. This is called discovery. And I'm sure big data can help a lot to discover, to discover just like Kepler did, to match suddenly an existing concept with something observed in billions of data. And big data will help definitely. But this is only 50% of insight. Of insight. Copernic, Copernic for, for example, has a big bank in his mind. Wow, the sun is wow. Zero impact on the planets. Zero impact, still, just like before. It was only in the mind. We are a business community. We want to change the world. So we need to be Copernic, but more than that, or Kepler, but more than that. And we need not to discover, we need to invent. And I'll give you another example. It to me fantastic. I used to be a banker, and I'm fascinated by accounting. Accounting. This accounting book is 500 years old. You know what's double entry bookkeeping? Probably you know. This is incredible. It was a big bang, fantastic evolution of accounting. Fantastic. But there was a but. You have to enter all data twice. Imagine the resistance to change 500 years ago. This is not a discovery. This is an invention. And the difference with Kepler, Kepler, the, the ellipse existed. Here, nothing existed. It was produced by the mind. Suddenly, a new concept, double entry accounting. But there was no match possible. We are not with a discovery. We, I'm sorry for this. We are with an invention, but I see the timing. With an invention. And of course, I claim technology in general, and big data in particular, will help to discover, but cannot invent. Because inventions assume to forget, assume to, to make a choice between different possibilities. Because, as I told you, what you have here, only hypothesis. And that's, so it goes automatically, let us think. I go backwards, okay? Look at the two keyboards. Some people never notice the one, two, three is at the top for the telephone and the bottom for the calculating machine. If you look at this, you realize that there was a kind of lack of thinking because, I know, like technology drove the thing. So, I have another five minutes. I think the problem is now on the table. 
Thinking is not possible for a machine. In my view, deduction is fine. We still deduce a bit, let's give that to machine. But let's rediscover the power of induction. You can go in the books of philosophy. Induction is the ultimate challenge. How do we simplify? How do we produce models? How do we patterns of frameworks and mindset, etc., etc.? So now I have another four minutes not to conclude because there is no conclusion on this, but just to give you some hints. So, and that's the black swan. That's, it's more blank than black. So it's the book of Taleb, but he took the idea of Karl Popper. A black swan is an event highly unlikely to happen, but with high impact. Like I was sitting here for the Rosetta story yesterday night, and what, that's what he said. Uncertainty is a big deal, is a big deal. And with technology, you don't solve the uncertainty problem. Look at this one. And it's a bit like a summary. So, of course, we built machine with rules and we take things for granted. You have two types of change. You can change within a set of rules. But what's the challenge of this conference and the digital world? The rules are going to change, are going to change. And you only have two options. Either you decide to change your own rules or somebody will change your rules. I call this, it's Eureka or Caramba, but that was, that's another story. So, black swans, what's a black swan? Events unlikely to happen with big, 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 big impact. Like last week when the Swiss franc went up by 20%, if I remember correctly. So black swans, it shows that when you think you move in a set of rules, if you, ch you play chess, okay, you move the queen, but you know exactly what you don't know, what it's going to do. Because for you and the other, the rules remain the same. Today, the rules of the game are changing. So we need to be careful for black swans. I have two other examples. So event unlikely to happen, but of course, if it happens, it's a big deal. So, and probably this one is one of my favorite because it's, it looks like we always make assumptions. Whatever the topic, when we think, we always make assumptions. But sometimes we forget that here, in the mind, in the mind, everything is a hypothesis. You cannot achieve certainty here because it's produced by induction. And induction, I explain the rule. You need to forget. So, what should I conclude? Nothing. I, I won't conclude, but I'm going to stop because many other speakers after me. What should we recap of Samurai? Two main things. To conceptualize, you need to forget. And second, a concept is never true, never false. The only relevant question about a concept is this useful. So two things will escape forever technology. Creativity, the way I define. Innovation is to make more of the same. It's respecting the rule. You innovate. Okay, it's fine, and you make a lot of money. Creativity is about changing the rule. And a program and a machine cannot change its own program. So two things a machine will never do. Creativity and responsibility. As I told you, a concept is never true. So somebody has to make the choice between the different arrow. And this is going to be my last sentence, probably with this. A machine will never hit a button. Thank you. Thank you.